Welcome. I'm going to talk about how Paul Graham writes an introduction today. Paul Graham, in the world of online writing, is a legend, and I think for good reason. He is somebody who's both been phenomenally successful in part because of what he's gotten from his writing. He started writing, I think, in the 90s and ended up starting a startup studio called Y Combinator and writing a series of essays which he compiled into a book called Hackers and Painters. And it's crazy. I feel like if I'm hanging out with people who've spent a lot of time around Silicon Valley and I ask, who is the person who has influenced you the most? The person I hear the most is Paul Graham. His essays have been extremely influential and not just in America or Silicon Valley, but also around the world. And I think that that has happened because his writing is so simple. It's so clear. And I always think of this idea called writing friction. So when you're reading what somebody else has written, how much work are you trying to do in order to understand and make sense of those ideas? And with Paul Graham, the answer is usually very little, not because the ideas are simple in a way that they're dumbed down, but because his writing is so clear. He does the work as a writer so that the reader doesn't have to do work later in order to make sense of what he's trying to say. And so in this video, I'm going to break down the introduction to his essay called A Project of One's Own, just two paragraphs, and I'm going to deconstruct it to show you what Paul Graham does to write clearly and capture the reader's attention at the beginning of a piece. Now I want to talk about what Paul Graham does here to grab the reader. And we'll start with just what are the purposes of an introduction? Of course, to grab the reader. You know, I'm not sure that attention spans are actually getting shorter, but one of the things that I've definitely found is that the best online writers grab their readers very fast. I bet that when it comes to my essays, I spend 20% of the time just on the first... 30 seconds of a reader's experience. So that goes from sort of in order. I spend disproportionately the most amount of time on the title, then quite a bit of time on the first sentence or two, and then really try to get out that beginning structure and just get it right. And then also the purpose of an introduction is to set up the context. There's a line from this book on advertising, and I think it's called The Secrets of the Written Word. And the writer says that you want to get three yeses in 30 seconds. Now, I think this is a good general idea. I wouldn't copy it exactly. But basically, there is a line from the world of copywriting where you say, okay, you want to catch the reader's attention with the title, make them say, yes, I'm in. You want to catch their attention with the opening sentence, make them say, yes, I'm in. And then you want to do it again with something that comes right after that, just make them say, yes, I'm in. And then what you're doing is you're almost creating this like sliding scale to get the reader to build some momentum. And then what you're doing when it comes to actually setting the context is you're beginning to introduce themes and motifs that are subconsciously being planted in your reader's mind. And then you're gonna to return to them later. So what I wanna do is actually read this introduction to you out loud, and then I will go through it sentence by sentence and explain why it works. And you don't even need to read the whole essay to realize why it's a good introduction. So it goes like this. A few days ago on the way home from school, my nine-year-old son told me he couldn't wait to get home to write more of the story he was working on. This made me as happy as anything I've heard him say, not just because he was excited about his story, but because he discovered this way of working. Working on a project of your own is as different from ordinary work as skating is from walking. It's more fun, but also more productive. What proportion of great work has been done by people who were skating in this sense? If not all of it, certainly a lot. I want to talk about this idea of total addressable market, and it comes from the world of Silicon Valley startups. So when an entrepreneur is pitching a venture capitalist, often the venture capitalist will ask, what is the TAM for this company? How big could this company spread? And there's companies like Uber or Lyft and the ride sharing market. It is evident and shows up in what almost every major city around the world. And so you can have billions of people who are using the services of that company. Whereas when it comes to, say, the tripod that I use to 
work with this very specific kind of camera, maybe that one is smaller because there's not that many people who are making videos like this. And the same thing applies in writing. Different ideas, stories, metaphors, they have different total addressable markets. And what Paul Graham is doing here is he's using the story of a father and a son. And everybody can relate to this in some way. Whereas, say I use the example of my favorite music set on YouTube, which is Porter Robinson's live world show from Second Sky. Well, not that many people are actually interested in that, so the TAM is smaller. Now, you might think, okay, so a big TAM is always bigger because more people get it. And that's actually not true at all. Often you want a small TAM and to use a very specific story when you want to appeal to a certain audience and say, hey, you are my people, come on in, and when you want to repel others. And you see that there's a direct relationship between affinity and total addressable market. Often for niche stories like the Porter Robinson one, for people who are fans of Porter Robinson, that creates a certain connection, but it comes at the cost of alienating people, the vast majority of people who have never heard of him. And so what he's doing here is he's consciously saying, what is a story that a lot of people are going to relate to? And that serves as the genesis of this piece, but it also doesn't really alienate anybody at the beginning. What Paul Graham does after the story, which look, is only two sentences, he ends it with because he discovered this way of working. And that relates to the title, which is a project of one's own. And I always think of the title actually as part of the introduction. They always work in unison because people read that title, they have it in their mind, and it is the thing that is setting the frame for what comes in the introduction. And my bet, if we somehow had access to Paul Graham's keyboard strokes is that he thought about ending this paragraph after he discovered this way of working. Why? Because it's the end of that introductory story. And you'll see the next two sentences have a very different rhythm and a very different cadence and a very different meaning. But what he ultimately did was decide to keep those things together because they kind of form the narrative arc of the entire piece. And he says, working on a project of your own is as different from ordinary work as skating is from walking. It's much more fun, but also much more productive. And Paul Graham does this a lot. He has an essay called The Four Quadrants of Thinking, I think it is, and it's the same thing. He introduces what the piece is about in that first paragraph, and then he sort of builds upon it after. This is something that is very distinct to Paul Graham that I haven't seen a lot of other people do. And you'll see what he does right after he talks about working on a project of your own. From that paragraph, he mentions skating there. And then in the first sentence of the next one, he mentions skating again. And now, as a writer, you need to know this. When you repeat yourself, people will say, oh, it's bad to repeat yourself. It's not true at all. But you have to do it deliberately. You have to do it intentionally. When you repeat yourself like this, you are setting up themes and motifs that the reader is now subconsciously expecting to return throughout the piece. So when I see skating being used twice in three sentences right in the introduction, I'm thinking to myself, not even consciously sometimes, this is something that I need to pay attention to because the writer is going to come back to it in the future. And so as a writer, you can say, okay, these are my main motifs. How do I actually introduce them at the beginning? And how do I do that deliberately? And then what Paul Graham is doing is he is using that metaphor, skating, very deliberately because it does a lot of work for him and it saves him a lot of work in terms of, he doesn't need, like the economy of language there is so good, right? Think of skating. When it comes to skating, what do you think of? You think of sort of gliding. You think of a lack of friction. You think of going left and right, sort of exploring a little bit. You think of something, ooh, this is a good one, something that is fun, but it's not fun in the way that like going to an amusement park is fun. Oh my God, that's so much fun. It's fun in the sense that you're in a flow state, you're focused, you're, you're sort of in it. And you look back at it and you're like, hmm, that was pretty fun. But it was fun in the sense that something was meaningful. And it's also productive in the way that it's good for you. And so the word skating, which Paul Graham uses twice, encompasses all those ideas. And it's like an atomic bomb. He's packing 
all of those metaphors into one word, using it twice. And now he can basically stand on the shoulders of that idea as he actually writes. And finally, when it comes to this introduction, what I see is a very simple language. Maybe there's one word here that's more than three syllables productive proportion i mean those are the longest ones so he's using simple words you know when we were in high school if somebody used to say you know some big fancy word we'd be like sat word and paul graham has none of those he writes with very simple language and once again to go back to the tam idea simple language is high tam a lot of people can read your work and i think that that's something that people really like about paul graham you know his writing is intelligent but he doesn't dumb things down it's easy to understand but he's not trying to write for a five-year-old you know he is writing very complicated ideas and he's living proof that you can do that with clear language and very simple thinking and story structures that's what i've picked up from paul graham and i think that just that's why people love him and then finally one of the things that i'm always thinking about here is he ends with the rhetorical question and what that does is it establishes a relationship between the writer and the reader where he's saying he's asking you a question as if you're in conversation with him and it's something very personable and then as he goes into the next paragraph he says there is something special about working on a project of your own and I'll leave you with this very funny Family Guy clip about what happens when you see the title of the piece in the piece. Thanks for watching. Boy, I usually only get this excited when they say the title of a movie in the movie. I'm telling you, these drug dealers represent a clear and present danger to the United States. Eh, eh, he said it, he said it. All I'm saying is, what if this is as good as it gets? Eh, eh, there it is, there it is. The only way for me to solve this crisis is to be Superman 4, the quest for peace. Oh, that's why they call it that.